Hi everyone, thanks for tuning in to Taproot TV today. I'm Emily Print and I'm here with Mark Paradise and we are going to talk to you about the first steps to improving asset reliability. It was funny this morning she said, what is asset reliability? And, and of course everybody who's probably watching this mm -hmm. knows, but I said, well it's like you own a car, that's your asset, and if it breaks down, that's not reliable. Yep. So you want to make your asset as reliable as possible. And of course the the key thing to do is have, you know, if there's an equipment problem, you need to know how to troubleshoot it. Mm -hmm. And I was making jokes this morning about troubleshooting with a hammer. That, you know, if it doesn't work, hit it with a hammer and it'll work. And if it doesn't, hit it harder. But that probably isn't the best troubleshooting method. No, I, uh, I know that happened a lot with the computer, you know. 20 years ago, you'd hit it, smack it around the printer, it's not working, yeah, hit it, might, it, that'll make it work. It might work, it might work. Yeah. And if it would, does, then you found your troubleshooting method, you're gonna try on everything, right? <laughs> yeah. Now where on the car are you gonna hit it to get it to work? That's the key yeah. thing to know. <laughs> walk around so, with a hammer. Yeah, walk around, keep one in your glove compartment, yeah. just in case. So this, this really goes back a long ways, this whole topic does, to back in the late 90s, I was working with equipment reliability expert Heinz Block and what we discovered was that people doing root cause of equipment problems weren't ready to do root cause because they really hadn't troubleshoot, didn't do good troubleshooting so they didn't understand the problem well enough to do root cause and they, for they thought well root cause doesn't work because they didn't do good troubleshooting. So we decided we had to put together a troubleshooting system. We called it Equifactor. It's Equifactor troubleshooting tables. And that's the first step in getting better asset reliability is understanding your failures, being able to troubleshoot those failures and, and not using a hammer or not saying I'm going to replace the cheapest part first or not saying I'm just going to keep replacing these until it works. Um, I remember this is also back in probably, maybe it was the early 2000s, late 1990s. Um, I was on an offshore oil platform and they were having problems with their downhole pump. And I asked them, well, how many times does it fail? And the guy didn't know. And so we started looking. We found out on average it was failing every three months. And they were have to, having to send it off to be uh, rebuilt every three months. And a pump should last a lot longer than three months. And sometimes it was as little as a month. They yeah. fix it, put reinstall it, and then boom, it would fail again. Sometimes it might last six months. So they'd think, oh, we got it solved, but then it would fail again. And nobody knew how often it was failing because the offshore um, guys, it might happen on somebody else's shift and right. they didn't even turn it over to the other guys. They'd send it ashore, um, and get it back and install it and they wouldn't even know and so nobody knew the how much it was happening and nobody was asking questions as to why it was happening and they weren't troubleshooting the problem mm -hmm. so you have to understand there's a problem and you have to troubleshoot it and and i guess that's where really equifactor comes in because equifactor is a great troubleshooting technique that really will get you to find what's going on, how is this happening, and get the information you need to be able to do a good root cause analysis and stop these failures from happening over and over and over again, mm -hmm. which is what asset reliability is all about, stopping failures. So that's really the purpose of this. Now, I got one more joke to put in, okay. and, and so we'll put in a little shot here of a troubleshooting table, and the way the troubleshooting table works, and I'll talk you through it, but it'll be up here on the screen as I talk you through it. And it, the way it works is, you start off by asking a question, mm. um, does it work? And if it works, don't mess with it. And, and then there's a little stop sign at the bottom, and that's where you stop. If it's working, don't mess with it. But if it's not working, did you mess with it? Well, if you messed with it, um, then you're going to go down. But if you didn't mess with it, will you get in trouble? And if you'll get in trouble, hide it. Uh -huh. But, but if, if you are going to get in trouble, then 
it's too bad for you. So it either ends with a stop or it's too bad for you. Uh, the other one is, if you did mess with it and somebody knows and you will get in trouble, that's too bad for you. So you can follow this, you can follow this um, troubleshooting chart. And this was given to me by a vice president at a utility. And he thought it was really funny, but his guys had given it to him and they thought he needed this because that's the troubleshooting methods they were using. And, uh, and they didn't think it was funny. They thought, oh, he'll get this then and he'll stop you know, blaming people essentially for all the troubles that are going on. So this is the basics of troubleshooting. Equifactor is the step beyond this. So in Equifactor, we start out with the troubleshooting tables. Mm -hmm. Which is the first step to, with a, uh, when you're having an, an issue, you want to, Ken and I were talking about, sometimes you, you don't need to get into that. It's a simple fix. So how do you know when to go ahead and just figure it out versus I need to go through this troubleshooting process? That's a really good question because I don't think there's an answer to that. Okay. I think people think that they know the answers a lot of times when they don't know the answers. Mm -hmm. They think it's a simple fix and it isn't okay. a simple fix. So, you know, I'd say if you've got a failure and you think you know what it is, maybe you can fix it once, and, but if it comes back again, then maybe it wasn't okay. such a simple. So if it starts to be repetitive, then maybe you ought to go to your Equifact troubleshooting tables and see what am I missing that this keeps happening. Okay. Even if it's simple, I'm missing something because it keeps happening over and over gotcha. again. So we're going to start at the table, like you're saying. You start at the tables, and basically what you're going to do is say, do I have a troubleshooting table for this? There's equipment troubleshooting ta tables, there's valve troubleshooting tables, there's um, component troubleshooting tables, there's, uh, there's all sorts of them. There's four different things, and each one of those has things under it. And, and the example I'm going to use today is a pump. Okay. So if you're, you've got a pump that failed, let's, let's say it was that offshore pump that failed, and you're going to go into that and say, well, why did it fail? And so you've got a pump. And then you choose the type of pump. This is a centrifugal pump. And then you say, what is the symptom you're having? And maybe this is short bearing life is the symptom. So you got bearing life that's not very long. Well, you can go into a, a list of potential causes, and then you work your way through a process of selection and elimination. No, it's not that. It could be that. Um, what do I have to do to find out if it's that? Um, so, you know, it could be the pump's misaligned. Mm -hmm. Well, how do I know if it's misaligned? It could be we're not lubricating the pump right. Well, how do I know if we're not lubricating? So you're going you're gonna to eliminate some stuff because you're going to know that's not the problem. Mm -hmm. But there's going to be one, two, three, five things maybe that you can't eliminate off, off the top of your head. Some of those may be really simple things to find out. Um, if the pump isn't pumping rated flow, well, maybe the problem is you've got the suction valve partially shut or you've got the discharge valve partially shut. Well, that's easy to go check, right? You can just mm -hmm. go check if the valves are open. But other, and, or a strainer might be clogged. Well, you can check to see if the strainer is clogged. All those don't require tearing down the pump. But you may end up with two or three things that are left that require you to tear down the pump. So you may end up saying, I've checked all the things I can check without damaging anything or without tearing anything apart, but now I've proven that I can't find a cause and I need to tear it apart. Mm -hmm. So you can justify your boss, we've got to take the thing down, we've got to pull right. it out. Then you go in and you say, well, what am I going to do while I take it apart, when I tear it down, when I pull out of the system? Are there things I have to check and, and I have to check it while I'm tearing it down, or I have to make measurements before I tear it down to see if it, everything's good. So you may have to make yourself a little tear down procedure or troubleshooting procedure that you check these things as you disassemble it. Mm -hmm. And if you disassembled it without checking that, you may lose the evidence of why the failure occurred. Right. So you really, you really want to that's why you want this sort of a checklist affair to do this, so you make sure you don't skip anything and you don't miss anything, and in doing that, you miss what the problem was. And, and when you're talking about this checklist with, with Equifactor, um, 
I'll you, put a couple of these up on the screen as we okay. go through this uh, so they can see what they look this like. This is through software. There's not a paper method to... There, there is a paper method and a software method. Okay. In, in our book, and I think this is book five, um, the Equifactor book, it has all the troubleshooting tables that we have today in the back of the book. The software, you have all those tables, plus you can develop your own... Um, custom tables that you can put in there. So when you're talking about doing the things where you're having a disassembling, you could uh, make it customized to you, let's look say, for that. Okay, well, that you could do too, but what you, what you really want to do is, let's say it's not a centrifugal pump. It's some kind of strange equipment that we only use and nobody else uses. Right. And so therefore we can develop our own troubleshooting table that works just like the others, for our specific equipment so that we can be systematic in troubleshooting it. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't have to be in there already. We can add tables. Right. So, so there's, a, there's a set of tables that's in there already, but you can expand on that. And we've had people do that. Um, you know, we've got a widget manufacturer and it's a special equipment that we built, and, but we can troubleshoot it because we know what those symptoms are and we know what causes those symptoms, and so we can make a troubleshooting table. And even if you make one and you don't have all the symptoms or all the, the uh, potential causes, mm -hmm. over time you may discover, oh, I've got an additional, I've never seen this symptom before. I need to add this to the right. troubleshooting table. And I need to add those potential causes, mm -hmm. and then we can once again be systematic. And the, the benefit of, of this systematic um, troubleshooting is instead of like you were saying at the beginning how somebody has a problem and it's different shifts and not everybody's on the same page then you're you're continually troubleshooting using a procedure a method that's um, consistent and it's tr uh, trendable to see how often is that breaking and, and then exactly what is the real thing that's happening because you could just keep replacing a part well, and not realizing there's more going on exactly the other thing that's really interesting and important in this, I guess, is that um, I remember I went to teach uh, Equifactor at a company that manufactured bearings. And the people in the course were their experts on bearing troubleshooting. Okay. And I thought, oh, I'm going to look like an idiot because they're going to know so much more than I do. So we're going to go to the, the bearing troubleshooting tables or the pump troubleshooting tables and they're going to say, well, this is worthless. I know all this. Mm. But it was just the opposite. What they said was, wow, this is great. It puts all this knowledge in one place. And yes, I know this, but I can now use this as a checklist to make sure I don't miss anything. Mm -hmm. And it was really, I guess, satisfying to see these people who were experts in that say, wow, this is great stuff. We can use this. Mm -hmm. And it isn't just for people who don't know what they're doing. It's for people who, who know what they're doing, who need who need to be systematic when they do this troubleshooting and want to be able to say, yep, I checked everything and it's all good. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Really cool. Um, so we are talking again about the first step to approving asset reliability. That's a tongue twister. Yep. Uh, um, there's more than one step, of course. After that, we talk about the troubleshooting tables, but really... Um, well, first you get the troubleshooting done. Mm -hmm. Then if you really want to fix things, you've got to do... Taproot. Yeah. You've got to do root cause analysis. Mm -hmm. So you're going to you're going to go from that information, you're going to put it on your snap chart and you're going to take it through the root cause tree. Yeah. And that's the the end part of all this. And then once you un this is this is learning from your operating experience, from your failures so that you don't repeat them. There's other things you can do to improve asset reliability as well. Hammers. Yeah. yeah. Obviously, hammers work really well. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, so one thing you can do um, is get in, a, get in a course if you're not familiar. Well, if you need to learn this stuff, you need to get either in a five-day or an Equifactor course. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we have both uh, live uh, Equifactor courses, two days, and we have uh, virtual, mm -hmm. virtual live, I guess I'd call them. The instructor's live. <laughs> But it's, it's done virtually and you learn from your desk. Yeah. And so you need to decide which one you really want to go to. I know some people prefer live training because 
you get to be there and um, face to face and network with other people a little more easily mm -hmm. than you can do over a TV screen or a computer screen right. or a, whatever you're going to use for your e-learning. The virtual training is, is synchronous, not asynchronous. So it is a designated time uh, and date. Synchronous. I've yes. never heard of it called that before. Yeah. Um, so that helps in college when you're like, do I have to be present at a certain dedicated time well, you do or have do to it be, on my own time? No, no, no. You have to be present because so the guy's going to be there yep. live. And, uh, and, and it's really um, the, the live instructor. We've gotten really good at teaching mm -hmm. virtual courses because we've done quite a bit of them during this COVID stuff. Yeah. And we really work on making that virtual course we try to make it just as interactive and just as um, good mm -hmm. as the live courses are. I agree. Yeah. So you can check out our courses at taproot.com forward slash courses and find in-person or virtual courses online um, that are near you. And we'll put the link down below yeah. in the notes. Absolutely. Mark, is there anything else you want to add about asset reliability well if they want to read more of course there's the article that goes with this so yeah. they can, it's slightly more than what we talked about but not much we've yeah. covered it pretty well i think yeah we'll put a link to that as well um down below and then while we're talking about links don't forget to subscribe to our channel we put out videos every week on wednesdays at noon and the bell and ring the bell. Um, You'll get notified. Then. Notified that there's a new video. And we're on all the major channels. So you can also find us on Facebook and LinkedIn. And and uh, what about the, what are they called? The, the new thing? What's that? Tick, are you talking about TikTok? No, I don't uh, think, I never think about TikTok myself. <laughs> I don't think about TikTok either. I was thinking about the, um, oh, what are they called? The you can listen to this instead oh, of watching a podcast. A podcast, yeah. yeah. We're on all I'm the sort major of old school podcasts. Thinking. We're on all the major podcasts, right? Whatever channels they are, or whatever they are. Yeah, you can watch us in podcasts. You can listen. No, you can't watch us. You, you can have listen, to listen in a podcast. It's only listen. We're we're everywhere. So we hope you will tune in next week and uh, check out our blog where we have all kinds of articles on asset reliability and ways that you can improve. Thanks for joining. Bye.